Hello there. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Eric McKay and this is News Channel Nebraska. Let's take a look at our top headlines today. Two police officers in Omaha who shot and killed two men last weekend are in the clear. Police have announced the officers fired their weapons by the book and at the same time, Police say the two dead men were in the country illegally. Joe Jordan takes us through the South Omaha scene, beginning with a call to 911. 1530, shots Five days after two Hispanic men were shot and killed by two off-duty Omaha police officers, we hear today from Omaha Police Chief Todd Schmatter for the first time. I'm Joe Jordan reporting. According to the police chief, the two men were in the country illegally. The chief also says the county attorney has ruled the shootings justified, and Schmatter says they were also within department policy. When I asked him if this was a difficult decision, the chief told me no. Would you consider this a close call in those decisions at all? I, I don't. Pretty once, you, once you reevaluate the evidence and you look at the deadly, deadly force situation and the deadly threat that these officers were facing, there was a crowd of people, <clears throat> a gun was fired into it. In the aftermath of verbal altercations between two groups, the officers were justified in that. The dead man identified as 26-year-old Fernando Rodriguez Juarez and 28-year-old Jonathan Hernandez Rosales. The police officers, Captain Jay Levitt, who has been with OPD for 25 years, and Officer Robert Soldo, who's been with OPD eight and a half years. The two were working security at the Ecstasis nightclub when a disturbance inside spilled outside. Here's a look at the key moment captured on surveillance video narrated by Omaha police. You can see Mr. Hernandez Rosales and Mr. Rodriguez Juarez running towards the black Jeep Cherokee with Mr. Rodriguez Juarez getting into the driver's seat and Mr. Hernandez Rosales getting into the front passenger seat. Mr. Rodriguez Juarez can be seen raising his right hand with what appears to be a handgun directly in front of the front seat passenger, Mr. Hernandez Rosales. The Jeep is then illuminated by the officer's flashlights. Captain Levitt is seen firing his weapon at the vehicle as Officer Soldo crosses in front of the Jeep and fires his weapon. The Jeep then accelerates and almost strikes Officer Soldo as it passes by the officers. According to Chief Schmader, there was no time for talking during this incident. That when one shot was fired from the car, officers then responded with 21 shots of their own. 12 from one officer's gun, 9 from another. Each individual was hit three times. In Omaha, Joe Jordan, News Channel, Nebraska. Turning to the courtroom, the suspect in a Nebraska priest's murder entered a not guilty plea on Thursday. 43-year-old Kier Williams entered that plea Thursday morning. He's accused of stabbing to death Father Stephen Guxel at a Fort Calhoun church in December. Williams, who has warrants in five other states, currently being held in Washington County without bond. A trial date has not yet been set. A Grand Island, meanwhile, man is scheduled for April trial in a case where he's accused of stealing from a church-affiliated daycare center. 37-year-old Andrew Moss pleaded not guilty to theft by unlawful taking. Moss is the former director of St. Paul's Lutheran Church Cornerstone Early Learning Center. He was arrested in November when the church reported a theft in excess of $150,000. Court records show police found numerous suspicious transactions connected to Moss, including $50,000 in ATM withdrawals and $97,000 in Visa gift cards. Investigators say that money was deposited into Moss's personal bank accounts and into his online gambling accounts. His trial has been scheduled for April 29th. In national news, special counsel Robert Hur released a searing report Thursday about President Joe Biden's mishandling of classified documents following his time as vice president. The report also detailed concerns about his memory. Jen Sullivan breaks down the report and the reaction from Biden and Republicans. 
special counsel releasing a scathing report Thursday that found President Joe Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified military and national security information, but said charges would not be filed, saying they were unwarranted even if Justice Department policy didn't preclude charges against a sitting president. President Biden holding a last-minute primetime address Thursday night to discuss the report. The special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. The 345-page report comes after a 15-month-long investigation into his mishandling of classified documents following his time as vice president under President Barack Obama. Photos released by the Department of Justice show classified documents stashed under printers in an office in his Delaware home, others in boxes in a garage. The pictures of these documents taken between December of 2022 and January of 2023 before being seized by the DOJ. The White House pushing back on what it called inaccurate and inappropriate comments in the report, including a reference that Biden would likely present himself to a jury as, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Special counsel Robert Hur writing Biden, quote, did not remember when he was vice president or when his son Bo died. These assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. When asked about his memory, he fired back at reporters. And my memory is fine. He focused on the fact that charges weren't filed against him, unlike former President Donald Trump, who is facing multiple criminal charges related to his handling of classified documents. Republicans quick to react. The special counsel's observation was pretty stunning. It's unnerving that the world can see this. I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. Closer to home, a Nebraska state senator touting a bill that would give the Nebraska State Patrol $200,000 to hire what he's calling an ethical hacker. Senator Lauren Lippincott of Central City says this hacker would spend their days trying to break into the state's computer network and election equipment and software. The idea is for the hired hacker to find any vulnerabilities in those systems that could be exploited by malicious hackers. Lippincott says he got the idea from a nephew who did similar work. A Lippincott staff says they've yet to find other states that have hired independent hackers, but Missouri has hired a company that employs so-called white hat hackers to provide that service. Elsewhere in the unicameral, Nebraska would become one of the last Republican-led states to enact a so-called stand-your-ground law under a bill being considered by lawmakers. State Senator Brian Hardin says he brought the bill Thursday at the urging of his constituents. He also wants to keep residents who use deadly force while defending themselves in an attack from being prosecuted. Nebraska among a handful of states where the law says a person has a duty to retreat from theft if they can do so safely before using deadly force. The exception is that Nebraskans can use deadly force in their homes or workplaces already with no duty to retreat. Another bill in the unicameral would reduce the number of early voting days in election years. Next week, a legislative committee taking up LB-121. That's a bill that would reduce the time that voters have to receive, complete, and return absentee ballots or vote early in person from 35 days to 22. Well, that has some voting rights nonprofits questioning the logic of condensing election officials' time to process ballots, especially now when they're preparing for the state's first election requiring voter ID to make sure that all their new processes are detailed in their manuals and everything's in order as far as the new forms and envelopes they need to be providing to voters and doing lots of internal training and hiring to make sure that folks are really up to speed on all the nuances of that policy. Ewing says people have different reasons for preferring to vote by mail, including travel time to the polls, work schedule conflicts, and having more time to think about their choices. I think that folks have really engaged in this kind of voting and found it beneficial in a variety of ways. And I don't think it's the business of the state to really be limiting options available to our voters when what we should be focusing on is ways that we can make this more convenient and efficient for them. Opponents of vote by mail and early voting believe they increase voter fraud, although there isn't much evidence supporting that claim. Less than four-tenths of one percent of Nebraska's mail-in ballots in the 2022 midterm were rejected. The bill's first hearing is Wednesday in the Government, Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. Three CEOs representing Big Pharma in the hot seat over high drug prices on Capitol Hill. 
The heads of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Bristol-Myers Squibb defending their reasons why Americans pay more for prescriptions than just about every other country on the planet. Laura Aguirre has more. How could drug companies charge us, in some cases, 10 times more than they charge Canadians or people around the world for the same drug? How do they get away with this? That set the tone for Thursday's Senate committee hearing with CEOs from three of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. That what first responsibility is to the patients. We're eager to find solutions to these access and affordability challenges. Several lawmakers questioned just how eager, pointing to examples like Johnson & Johnson's arthritis drug Stellara. In Canada, the UK, Japan and France, the list price for a one-year supply is $20,000 or less. In the US, same drug, $79,000 a year. I agree with you that the prices in the US uh, are generally higher for medicines. Eliquis by Bristol-Myers Squibb, a leading blood thinner that reduces the risk of stroke, is priced at $7,100 a year in the U.S. In several other countries, it's less than 1000 The real difference is that in the U.S., patients get access to therapy, life-saving therapy, years before they do in the countries that you mentioned. We have priced Eliquis in the U.S., in our, in our estimation, consistent with the value it brings. These drugs and many others are currently on a list of prices Medicare and drug makers will be negotiating under the Inflation Reduction Act. But one thing was clear at the hearing. The pricing debate will continue on. And for now, many Americans will struggle to afford the medicine they need. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. About 2 million hand steamers have been recalled. The Consumer Product Safety Commission says the problem is they can spray hot water where the steam's supposed to come out. The units sold under the brand name Steamfast, Vornado, and Sharper Image. Vornado says they've gotten 122 reports of water spraying, including 23 reports of burns. The steamers were sold at Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, Amazon, and other retailers. Affected customers can get refunds or replacement units. There's been some unseasonably warm weather across the Cornhusker state of late, and that's meant many outdoor activities have become more doable. Jake Bartecki has more. Many areas in Nebraska are dealing with a warm winter, at least a warm start to February, leading to golfers itching to take the clubs out of the garage. One golf course in southeast Nebraska obliging that request is Beatrice Country Club. We spoke with Superintendent Andy Hamilton about how they manage course conditions during the winter and keep them ready for summer. This year was actually really easy because everything is, was thawed out after all that snow melted and we had, you know, warm days, warm nights. Um, really, there's no frost in the ground. Two primary things Hamilton and his staff monitor are drainage and surface moisture, both of which were suitable for the course to open earlier this week, allowing walking and cart path only. Additionally, there was limited frost. Most years you get free in, into the freeze thaw cycles, which can be kind of vicious where, you know, at night it gets really cold and freezes. During the day it warms up, surface thaws out, but the root zone's still still frozen. And then you then you worry about foot traffic, tearing the roots away, you know, tearing the roots. And, and so those the, the freeze thaw cycles can be tricky, but this year we haven't had that. Part of the reason golf courses have to be so cautious about opening too early is because of maintaining strong turf for the warmer seasons. You have turf that is not growing, not actively growing, and and so a lot of a lot of wear and tear on the turf when it when it doesn't have a, have the have the ability to recuperate itself. So that's probably the biggest biggest concern. For those planning to take advantage of the warm days, Hamilton says all etiquette remains the same year round. Fix ball marks and and walk carefully on the greens. They might be a little bit soft, but um, yeah, just same same normal course etiquette rules apply to winter as as in the summer. In Beatrice, Jake Bartecki, News Channel, Nebraska. You can stay up to date with the very latest by following us online. Head to newschannelnebraska.com. Click on the news tab there. You can also follow us on X, like us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Eric McKay and this is News Channel Nebraska.